part of the chapter I want to look at there first was in verse 16, where the Bible reads, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And then skip to verse 25. The Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The title of my sermon tonight is, Hearing the Holy Ghost. Now this is a topic where there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of you know, strange doctrines. There's a lot of weird ideas that people have. Let's go to, uh, I want to go to this uh, chapter. Go to Psalms 46 if you would. We'll go back to John 14 after a little while. Let's go to Psalms 46. Because there's all these people who come up with all these strange doctrines. And it seems to be that from this one verse, they just make up all these weird doctrines. So let's look in uh, Psalms 46 verse 10. The Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. And they don't even quote the whole verse, they just kind of quote that one phrase. And from this one phrase, there's so many churches today that will say, you know what you need to do? You need to get yourself locked in a closet, or go hide yourself, or get real quiet, and just let the voices come into your head and hear God, or hear the Holy Ghost, or let God speak to you. And you've got to discern which voice is the voice of God, and which the voice is you, and you've got to play this game of trying to figure out you know, what God's trying to say to you. But the ridiculousness part of this is this verse has nothing to do with that. Let, let's go one verse back and let's just get a little context. It says here, He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Now this is actually talking about prophetically in the millennial reign of Christ and the thousand year reign of Christ how there's not going to be any wars. There's nobody going to be fighting. God's going to break the bow. He's going to break the spear. God's going to be ruling the earth with a rod of iron. There's not going to be all this warfare and all this strife. So what is he saying? He's saying the earth is going to be still. And they're all going to know that God's the Lord. He's going to be reigning from Jerusalem on the earth. So what's the context? He's saying, look, no more war. Why? And he's talking about the millennial reign of Christ. That has nothing to do with you going in your bedroom by yourself and trying to listen to strange voices. That's not what this Bible verse is talking about. But there's so many churches today, there's, you know, the Pentecostals, the Assembly of God, these charismatic churches, all these mega churches, trying to teach, you got to get yourself quiet and just start listening to voices. That's Hinduism. That's paganism. That's demonic false doctrine. And we're going to see what it actually means to hear the Holy Ghost but as I was thinking about this, all they're doing is they're just having a figment of their own imagination. It's just all their own imagination. Go to Genesis chapter 6 if you would. You know, you sitting there and being quiet, and this thought comes in your mind, ooh, a Starbucks sounds good. Ooh, I should go to Chick-fil-A. Ooh, I should get a blue car. Ooh, I should go, you know, buy this house. That's not God talking to you. That's just your own imagination. That's just your mind wandering. And if you go somewhere privately and you're just letting your mind wander, you're going to think a bunch of weird thoughts. You're going to think of a bunch of weird imaginations. Look at Genesis 6 verse 5. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We see God destroyed all of mankind because their imaginations were filthy. Because they could constantly just thinking about evil and wickedness. And if you just let your, your mind wander, it's usually not going to think of the things of God. It's usually not going to be on good things. It's going to be things on the world. It's going to be strange, weird stuff. I mean, Walt Disney wants you to believe that imagination is so important. We need to encourage children to have a great imagination and have all this make-believe. It's junk. Let's look at what the Bible says about imagination. Go to uh, Genesis 8. Just flip one, a couple chapters over. They'll say, I saw this uh, slogan, it says, Imagination is the door to possibilities. 
No, it's the door to wickedness. It's the door to sin. It's the door to all kinds of filth and evil. Right. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. And the scorner is abomination to men. When you have all these weird thoughts, it's a sin. And look at Genesis chapter 8. You say, well, that was just those people. That was just the first generation. They were really evil. I'm not like that. Let's look at verse 21 in Genesis 8. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore every living thing as I have done. But God said, not just those people, even all the rest of men that I'm not going to destroy the flood, their imagination's wicked from their youth, from a kid. It's important that we don't foster that and encourage that. But what does Hollywood do? What does the movies and the TV? They're just, oh, you got to have a great imagination. you got to have all this make-believe. And they're just encouraging children to have wicked thoughts and evil thoughts and not think of anything real. Go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29. Now, don't get completely confused. I mean, the Bible says uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. There's a difference between having a vision and having an imagination. A vision is based on reality. A vision is saying, I want to be married one day, so this is what i got to do to get there. I want to be a pastor one day, this is what i got to do to get there. I want to go to church today, so I better think about what time I need to be ready and get out the door and go. That's having a vision. That's deciding, hey, I'm going to practically think about what I need to do to accomplish my future. Imagination is when you're wondering, oh, wouldn't it be great if I had a red Ferrari? Wouldn't it be great if I was just driving around town? Wouldn't it be great if I had another husband or another wife? Wouldn't it be great if I went to... I mean, that's just fil filthy. That's just wicked. But that's what the mind will do. That's what the carnal, fleshly heart wants to do. It just wants to imagine all this wicked, evil sin. And so if you're just sitting there quiet... And they're trying to tell you, hey, you're going to hear the Holy Spirit, you're going to hear the Holy Ghost. Usually you're just going to hear a bunch of weird filth when you're just trying to quiet your mind. Because they're trying to tell you, don't think of anything, don't be thinking about the Bible, just, just calm your mind, and just let thoughts enter in. You're never going to hear the Holy Spirit that way. You're never going to hear the, the Holy Ghost that way. The Bible says, for out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Deuteronomy 31, I'll read for you another verse. It said, And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know the imagination which they go about, even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear. God was constantly rebuking the children of Israel because in their heart, in their imaginations, they kept imagining like a golden calf. Or imagining serving the gods of Balaam. Or imagining all these wicked sins and abominations. And they were setting their hearts on those things and not on God. We look at Deuteronomy 29, we're going to see the same thing. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, And it, and it, come, to, and it come to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he blessed himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. We see what happens when they just get their own imaginations. All kinds of wicked sin. Look at verse 20 of that, that same part. It says, The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. We see what happens today is people, they, they have all these excuses for their sin. They have excuses for going out and getting drunk, for drinking wine. For, for committing fornication, for doing all kinds of wicked sins. Why? Because they get quiet, and in the magic of their heart, they say, well, I don't think it's that bad. Right. I don't think it's a big deal. It's not, it's, I'm just going to add drunkenness to my thirst. I'm going to have peace. God's not going to judge me. Have you heard the person say, well, I have peace about that. Yeah. You say, drunkenness is a sin. Oh, I, I have peace to that. Because yeah. they got it from their own imagination. They were going somewhere, and they were just letting their mind wander. They're like, it's not a big deal to drink. It's not that bad. God wouldn't condemn me. But I have peace about that. But we see that's just what people have always been like. It's not today. It's not just the, the, the world that we live in now. There's no new thing under the sun. All men want to just walk in the imagination of their own heart. They want to justify themselves. And they're going to add drunkenness to their thirst. 
That's why there's so much drunkenness in the churches today. Right. Why? Because the imagination of their heart. They're not hearing the Holy Ghost. We'll get there. I'm trying to lay down a foundation real quick. Go to uh, Jeremiah 13 if you would. I'm going to read for you a slew of verses real quick. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Look, God hates it. It's an abomination when you're just letting your mind wander and it's just thinking a bunch of filthy thoughts. It's thinking all this, this uh, abominable, wicked imaginations. The Bible says in Jeremiah 3, verse 17, In that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Jeremiah 7, 24, the Bible says, but they hearken not, nor incline their ear, but walked in the councils and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Jeremiah 9, verse 14. But have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Right. Jeremiah 11, verse 8. Yea, they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. Look at Jeremiah 13, verse 10, where I had to turn. This evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. We see the epidemic in these churches today is they refuse what the Bible says and when they're in their quiet time, when they're hearing these voices in their head, they give more credence to that. Because they just want to walk in the imagination of their evil heart. We can't trust in ourselves. We're supposed to trust in the Lord with all our heart. We're not supposed to lean on our own understanding, our own wisdom, our own thoughts. If you just sit and you just think, I mean, evil stuff can proceed out of your heart. We need to go to the Bible. We need to actually hear the Holy Ghost, the real Holy Ghost, to know what's right. To know how we should live our lives. How we should walk. And we notice these people, they don't really like God's Word. They refuse His words, but they embrace their own. They embrace their own imaginations, their own thoughts. We see it's popular. I mean, and this thing is popular today. It used to just be, you know, some a few Pentecostals. used to be just a few Assembly of God. I mean, that big charismatic movement... Didn't even start until, I could get the day wrong, I think it's like 1908. It's called the Zuzu Street. It was in California. This one guy just brought this new doctrine of all these charismatic gifts and hearing, you know, this special revelation and all this junk. And just from one little spark, now we have so much false doctrine spreading in all kinds of churches. I mean, even the Calvinist Baptist will get up and say, well... Yeah, there's some charismatic gifts, and yeah, we can hear God and get special revelation. I mean, it's, it's crazy today. I mean, it's affecting so many people. They refuse God's word, but they love their own thoughts. They love their own imagination. It's a popular thing. People are so arrogant and prideful today, they love to think that, oh yeah, what I'm hearing is you know, God's word. It's a big elephant in the room that none of them know what God really said, though. They all realize, they're all kind of wondering secretly, like, is that really God talking to me? Or was that just me making it up? Or They don't really know, but they all pretend like they do. It's like the emperor's new clothes. They're all, you know, he's just butt naked, but they're all like, look at that suit. It looks so good. Oh, God told me this, and God told me that. Well, where did the, what did the Holy Ghost really say? I'm just kind of building a foundation. We see the Bible's really consistent about the word imagination. It's not a good thing. It's not a positive thing mentioned here. Go to a 2 Corinthians 10. The Bible says in Jeremiah 16, 12, I'll read for you a couple more places. It says, And ye have done worse than your fathers, for behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked who can know it. The carnal heart, the carnal flesh that desires, is going to deceive you. It's going to trick you. You may not even realize that your fleshly carnal desires are pulling you away from God. That's why we need to be in God's Word. We need to be hearing the true Holy Ghost. 
so we can have the right mind. Our minds can be renewed by God's Word. The Bible says in Romans 1, 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Look there in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. The Bible says, Casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How many parents teach their kids that? How many parents say, hey, when you're having a filthy thought, hey, when you're having a wicked thought, children, you're supposed to cast down that imagination and bring it unto God's Word. Say, maybe I shouldn't have that thought. Maybe I shouldn't continue to think this way. Maybe I shouldn't have that kind of imagination. I should go back to the Bible and bring into captivity every thought under the obedience of Christ. Amen. But we see parents today, they want to foster their children and let them just do all kinds of weird stuff. We have little boys dressing up like little girls today. That's not an imagination that you should have with the Bible. That's an abomination. But we see parents today, they just want to foster all their kids, you know, strange whims and sinful imaginations that they have. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And we shouldn't just let our children just go aimlessly, you know, after their own imagination, after their own thoughts. Right. They need to be cast down and be brought into obedience to the Word of God. Why? Because those imaginations are going to affect you. Your heart's deceitful. It's going to pull you away from God. It's going to lead you into bigger sins. We see that sin starts with the thought. It starts with the mind. It has to start somewhere. It's with that first, you know, lustful thought, that first idea, that first imagination. And then we see people go after their sin. So if we can get it at the root, if we can stop it before, then we can save people from a lot of sin. We can save people, we can save our children from going down a lot of weird, wicked ways. Because the ways of this world, their minds are filthy. They're disgusting. They're vile. You tell anything, you know, under the pure, all things are pure. But the Bible says, them that are, I, I can't quote it for you, but it's like, them that are uh, unbelieving is defiled. And the Bible makes it clear that, you know, if you're thinking of things of God, if you're casting down imaginations, when somebody says something that's kind of borderline, they're not going to have, you know, uh, they call it like an innuendo. Or they have this thing where they, they're, they're saying something, and it could mean two different things. To the pure, they're going to look at it as pure. To someone that's, you know, has the mind of the world, they're going to look at it being filthy or disgusting or vile. I think of an example like the Catholics today, when Jesus Christ was talking about, you know, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, the Catholics literally think that's what they're supposed to do. Because they have a defiled mind, they have a wicked mind. The Bible says not to drink blood, so they have transubstantiation, where they think when they're going to the priest, they're literally drinking blood and literally eating the body of Christ. That's a weird imagination. That's a weird thought. We still need to bring every thought and imagination into captivity, bring it to obedience of Christ. So what does that have to do with hearing the Holy Ghost? Well, I think we need to make the clear separation that so many churches are teaching today that it's not just these random thoughts that are coming into your head. It's not just whatever you're thinking. No, the Holy Ghost is something that's very clear according to the Bible how He speaks to us. So how do you even get the Holy Ghost? Go to John chapter 7 if you would. Because we need to cast down the imaginations through the Holy Ghost. You say, it's hard to bring every thought into captivity to Christ. I mean, it ought, I'm being honest with you That's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to cast down every imagination, every foolish thought, to get even your thought life. Right. That's a big, that's a tall order. Right. That's not something that everybody can just do automatically. We need the power of the Holy Ghost to help us. Let's go to John 7, look at verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on Him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So they didn't have the Holy Ghost yet when Jesus was you know, with the disciples. We read in John chapter 14 how when He would leave, the Comforter would come. Go to uh, John 16 if you would. John chapter 16, just a few chapters forward. I'll read for you a few other verses. The Bible says in Matthew 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And in John 20, I'll read for you in verse 22, it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So when Jesus Christ was resurrected, the Bible says he breathed on his disciples, 
And they received the Holy Ghost. Look at John 16, verse 13. The Bible says, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. And He will show you things to come. So the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, this is a key phrase, shall not speak of Himself. Meaning what? Those, those carnal thoughts that you're having about going to Starbucks and which house to buy and which car to buy, that's not the Holy Ghost speaking to you. He doesn't speak of Himself. He doesn't just speak private, you know, little goofy thoughts. No. He only speaks what the Bible says. He only speaks that which the Father has said. He speaks the Word. He speaks of Jesus Christ. So if you want to hear the Holy Ghost, you have to get it from the Bible. There's only one source for the Holy Ghost. That's the Bible. And you get the Holy Ghost by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, as it says in Ephesians, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You receive the Holy Ghost by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the disciples, they didn't get the indwelling until Jesus Christ, you know, was risen again from the dead. And He breathed on them and they received it. And then as they went out to spread their word by a special miracle, when they would lay hands on someone, they received the Holy Ghost. But now if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells you in that moment when Christ quickens your spirit. Go to Jude chapter 1. I want to look at one other place. Jude chapter 1. You know, and as I was growing up, I went to these churches that were really weird on this doctrine. I grew up in a non-denominational charismatic church. They taught all kinds of weird junk. And it was never really that consistent. It was just, it was goofy. And my mom would always say, that the most important thing to her was that her children would hear the Holy Spirit, would hear the Holy Ghost, would hear God. She just she, she kept telling me, she's like, I just want you to hear God. I just want you to hear His voice. And as like a 12 or 13 or 14 year old boy, I was so nervous by this thought because I, I knew every time I would go and I would pray and I would like try to be quiet and try to hear voices, I was like, God's not speaking to me. <laughs> I know this is just imagination. This is just a fluke. I was like, how in the world are they getting it? And I thought all kinds of weird stuff. I thought because maybe I was too sinful, God wouldn't talk to me. Or I thought maybe, you know, I wasn't doing it quite right. Or maybe I wasn't praying enough. Or maybe I wasn't reading my Bible enough. I didn't know what to think. But I knew every time I would sit down, I just had all these weird, foolish thoughts. And I was like, that's not God. At least I was smart enough to know then that that was not the Holy Ghost. But I was still confused as to how to hear God exactly or what, what she meant by that. And she was, she was messed up. But look at Jude chapter 1, verse 19. The Bible says, These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life. Now some people twist this verse and they think that it's like speaking in tongues here. That it's speaking all this gibberish. That their praying is not with you know, the wisdom of their own mind. That they actually have the understanding of what they're saying, but it's some garbage. Now praying in the Holy Ghost would be praying a prayer that matches up what this book says. Right. Using these words to pray. When you're using your, the words of God to, to form a prayer. Now, I'm not saying you just repeat the Lord's Prayer or repeat just exactly what it's saying. It's coming from the heart, but using the words of God, that's praying in the Holy Ghost. That, that's one part of it. The other part is the fact that when He's indwelling inside you, the Bible says we know not how we you know, should pray for ourselves, but the Holy Ghost will uh, make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, the Bible says in Romans. So go to Luke chapter 1. I have four ways that we can definitively hear the Holy Ghost. This is a very important thing. This is a thing that we need to be solid on. We need to be grounded on. There's a, so much confusion out there today. And if we understand how to hear the Holy Ghost, it's going to help us in our daily lives. It's going to help us grow. It's going to help us cast down those imaginations. When we learn the difference between our own imagination and the Holy Ghost. How to get that right in our mind. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 67. We're going to read quite a bit here. The Bible says... And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. 
as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear, and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now we read quite a bit there, but there's a reason why. Why? Because we just heard the Holy Ghost speak to us. You just heard the Holy Ghost preach on you. But there's so many people today, there's so many churches today, they're saying, God, I just want to hear the Holy Ghost. God, I want to hear your voice. God, please talk to me. But they won't read these verses. Right. They wouldn't get up in church and read this many verses. They'd be like, let's just read one. Everybody's getting bored. But they'll sit there and scream and cry, I want to hear the Holy Ghost. I want to hear God talk. It's right here. If you really want to hear God's Word, you can hear it it's so easy. It's free. It's available to everybody. You can hear the Holy Ghost speak to you right now. But it's not just in this one passage. That was just a clear example. We're saying this is what the Holy Ghost said. Go to Acts chapter 2 if you would. The Bible makes it clear that the Bible is written by the Holy Ghost. It came through the mouth of the prophets by the Holy Ghost. Mark chapter 12, verse 36, the Bible says, For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thy enemies thy footstool. So you see, David, when he was preaching, he was preaching the words of the Holy Ghost. If you want to hear the Holy Ghost, the first one I have is you can come through preaching. Through a man of God preaching or prophesying the Word of God. If he's preaching the Word of God, you're hearing the Holy Ghost speak unto you. It's one of the most powerful ways to hear the Holy Ghost. Because a lot of times a preacher will get up, he'll compare spiritual with spiritual. He'll be comparing a lot of different verses together, and you can hear the Holy Ghost come together. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 4. The Bible says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We see through preaching, through preaching the gospel, through telling people how to be saved, they were speaking the words of the Holy Ghost. How can you hear the Holy Ghost? Some guy coming up and preaching the Word of God. Right. These people that want to hear the Holy Ghost, just start preaching the Word of God. Then they can hear the Holy Ghost. You know, and there's this weird kind of uh, perversion of what people will uh, use in believing in the King James Bible. Now, I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect Word. It's inerrant. It's infallible. We have all that God said. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And I believe God gave us every word. But there are some people that will take this to such an extreme that they'll say God's word is only in the English King James Bible. Like it couldn't be in any other language. Which is really strange because this was translated from the Greek and Hebrew. So to say that you couldn't even read those and get the word of God doesn't make any sense. But this passage right here proves that God's word can be spoken in all languages. Because we first understand that the whole Bible is written by the Holy Ghost. It was spoken by the Holy Ghost. And we see they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as what? The Spirit gave them utterance. So who was giving them the utterance? The Holy Spirit. Let me flip over there one quick second. Lord, look at those uh, other languages. Acts chapter 2. Let's look at verse, uh, I believe, 8. How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia and Egypt and other parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So right here we have clear evidence the Holy Ghost can speak in 
understand any language. He can speak in all of these languages. So it's not that the King James Bible is the only way somebody can ever get the Word of God. No. You can hear the Holy Ghost in any language. Because he was giving them the Word of God. He was speaking through these men. He gave them utterance to speak the Word of God. So we shouldn't take you know, the Bible to an unhealthy level and say, well, you know, all the Hispanic people, they've got to learn English and get the King James Bible. And all the people in the Philippines, they need to get the English Bible only. And those in Russia, and those in China, and those in Africa, they have to know English in order to be saved to get God's Word. I don't believe that. The Bible makes it clear that the Holy Ghost was able to speak in all these other languages. Right. Now maybe some of these languages don't have a, a good translation of the Bible, or they don't have a clear thing. I think the King James Bible is probably the best book. I think it's probably the best translation that we have today. It's the most popular book on the planet. We shouldn't go into a weird, health, unhealthy extreme to say, well, it's only English. Only, God only cares about English. The Holy Ghost can only speak in English. That's not, that's not true. The Bible says, for he shall not speak of himself. And we know that God's word just came from the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the word. If the Holy Ghost is speaking in other languages, then we know the whole Bible can be uh, spoken in other languages. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. So we see through preaching, through soul winners, through prophets, through men of God, through a pastor, through a bishop, when they're preaching the Word of God, you can hear the Holy Ghost. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't think this is necessarily the primary application of this verse, but I think one of the ways that you could look at this verse is the fact that if you're, re if you're only reading the King James Bible out loud, or you're only preaching the words of the King James Bible, you would never ever call Jesus Christ accursed. Right. Because God's Word is infallible. It's perfect. There's no problems in it. So if you pick up the NIV today, and you read how Jesus Christ is a liar in John chapter 7, you know that's not the Word of God. You know that's not the Holy Spirit. Why? Because by the power of the Holy Ghost, no man called Jesus Christ accursed. Now again, I'm not saying that's the primary application of the verse, but that's one way we could look at it. We could look at it and realize that God's Word, the Holy Ghost, would never say anything bad about Jesus Christ. So if you're reading a Bible that says something wrong about Jesus Christ, that's blaspheming Him, taking away His deity, you know that's not the words that the Holy Ghost speaks. You know that it's somebody else's voice. It's the voice of a stranger. It's not the voice of Jesus Christ. That's one of the ways you say, how do you know the Apocrypha is not the Bible? Because it blasphemes Jesus Christ. Because it calls Him accursed. Because it says all this weird junk about Him. That's how I know that it's not the Holy Ghost. I don't know the King James. It doesn't say anything negative about Jesus Christ. Cover to cover. Amen. This is God's Word. Go to uh, Acts chapter 7 if you would. I'll read for you a couple other places. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men were among you for my sake. John chapter 3, verse 34, the Bible says, For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Why were all the words that were coming out of Jesus Christ God's word? Because he didn't have the, he didn't have the Spirit by measure. When you when you just filled with the Holy Ghost. You're filled with God's words. Those are the things that are going to come out of your mouth. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's what the Bible says. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with God's word, that's going to come out of your mouth. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. I'll read for you one other place. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's talking about the Bible. Saying when Moses spake, he spake by the mouth of the Holy Ghost. When David spake, he spake by the mouth of the Holy Ghost. When all the prophets spake, they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God put His words into the man, into the prophets by the Holy Ghost. And they spoke God's Word. Look at Acts chapter 7 where you turn. So the second way we can get it is by reading the Bible. By getting what the words that the Holy Ghost gave us through the Bible. Acts chapter 7, look at verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. 
which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and gnashed on them with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and, standing, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stomped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So we see, oh, we back all the way up to verse 51. He says they were resisting the Holy Ghost. And look at verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They had the prophets preaching them the Holy Ghost. Preaching them the words of the Holy Ghost. And they resisted that. They didn't believe the Bible. When Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, He said, you don't believe Moses. You don't believe the words He gave. They were resisting God's Word. Because when you read the Bible, you're reading the words of the Holy Ghost. You say, I want to hear the Holy Ghost today. It's right here. It's the Bible. Open it up and read it. The, the prophets were not speaking of themselves. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. So you want to hear the Holy Ghost speak to you? Reading your Bible is one of the most key ways to do this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In Acts chapter 28 verse 25 the Bible says, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. A really uh, well-worded phrase here to give us the, the, the understanding that when Isaiah was speaking, he wasn't speaking of himself. It says the Holy Ghost spake by his ears. It was It's more the Holy Ghost than it is the God. It's like saying, well, was it the red pen that wrote it down? Or was it the, red, the green pen? Or the, it doesn't matter. It was the God. It was the Holy Ghost using Isaiah at that time. Or David. Or whoever. It doesn't matter. Amen. If you want to hear the Holy Ghost, it's through God's Word. Acts chapter 1, verse 16, I'll read for you. It says, Men and brethren, the Scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was to guide to them that took Jesus. It says over and over, these guys were not speaking by themselves. The Holy Ghost spake through that guy. He gave them the utterance. He gave them the words. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not of the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So this is really key. How are you going to compare spiritual things with spiritual? By reading the whole Bible. By reading the New Testament and the Old Testament. By comparing other verses with other. That's how you're going to get that understanding. How do you, how do you get the Holy Ghost to teach you? If you read your Bible, there's so many times when you're reading the Bible and you'll see one place say something and maybe it's repeated in the Old Testament or you go back. That's when the Holy Ghost is saying, hey, I want to teach you something right now. I want to show you what this means. When you're reading your Bible, you can have the Holy Ghost speak to you, but it's going to be God's words. It's not going to be your words. It's not going to be some man's words. No, it's the words which the Holy Ghost teaches the Bible. It's the words that He gave us. Go to uh, Romans 15, if you would. So my first point is that we can hear the Holy Ghost when a man of God preaches the Word of God, when he preaches the things that the Bible says. The second way is when we read our Bible. You say, I want to hear the Holy Ghost speak to me. I don't have a guy just 24-7 that's preaching me the Word of God. How do I hear the Holy Ghost? you got to get your Bible open. you got to read it. It's not being still and just thinking of whatever you want or your own imaginations. No, it's being with the Bible and reading the Bible. That's when the Holy Ghost is going to start speaking to you. It's not quieting your mind or letting your mind wander. No, it's being uh, profitable with your mind. Being fruitful with your mind by putting the things on God. Yeah. By putting your mind on the words of God. By meditating on His Word day and night. Ephesians chapter 5, look at my third point. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, and your heart to the Lord. You want to hear the Holy Ghost? Sing sing the Bible. Sing the Psalms. Sing God's Word. Then you can hear God's Word. You can hear the Holy Ghost speaking to you through song. And that will fill you with the Spirit. Why? Because you're getting more of God's Word in your heart. Singing is one of the best ways to get words into your heart. 
I mean, there's so many songs that I listened to growing up, just secular garbage songs that I hate, and I could sing the whole chorus, and I could sing the whole melody. Why? Because <laughs> my wife's saying no, because I do struggle with lyrics sometimes. But I'm just saying, you have those songs that you don't like, or you don't even want to hear, and you have the thing memorized, not because you tried hard, but just by singing. When you uh, sing the Word of God, when you sing the Psalms, when you're singing His words, it just imprints it in your mind in a completely different way than when you're just reading it or when you're hearing it preached. I think it's probably the most powerful way to get words just memorized. I mean, just something that you would never forget. That just the, 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 Maybe the music or the sound will just bring words into your remembrance. And it'll be God's words. Look at Romans 15. Look at verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with this people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, look, you want the power of the Holy Ghost? Sing unto His name. He said very clearly in verse 9, singing is going to give you the power of the Holy Ghost. I love it when I'm about to go soul winning or before I go soul winning, to just sing a couple of hymns or, or get some of the music, you know, and it lifts me up. It gets the words of God, you know, the Holy Ghost. It'll give me more power when I go out, more boldness. Amen. You know, the right attitude, the right spirit, the joy of God. When you praise the Lord, it just changes everything about your attitude. It changes your mind. It casts out of those wicked imaginations and puts your mind on the things of God. It helps you hear the words of God, the Holy Ghost. It prepares your heart. It renews your mind. Singing is so powerful. We need to be praising the Lord. That's how you can hear the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's how you can have the power. That's how you can change. You say, it's so hard to get all these wicked imaginations out of my mind. Well, why don't you start trying to sing more songs to God? Praise God more. Get the Holy Ghost speaking through you. That will help you cast down these wicked imaginations. Go to Colossians chapter 3 if you would. And 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible says in verse 15, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. He wants us to not just, you know, read the Bible with understanding. He doesn't want us just to pray with understanding. He wants us to sing with the understanding. Sing with the Spirit. Sing the words of God, and sing with the understanding. It's not this weird... I mean, I went to so many church services where they're getting up, and they're just sounding like garbage. They're just... Or they're having songs that just sing like a note. La, 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 la. I mean, that's not singing with understanding. That's a wicked imagination. No, we should be singing with the Spirit of God. God's words. Amen. Praising the Lord with His words, the words of the Holy Ghost, and getting those in our heart. Not some five-year-old or four-year-old's toddler just... Bleh, bleh. That's not praising God. God doesn't like that. No, He loves it when you're singing His words. He loves it when you're singing with the Spirit, singing through the Holy Ghost. Colossians 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Look, the Bible says over and over we're supposed to sing, we're supposed to praise the Lord. Why? So you can get that Holy Ghost just dwelling in you richly. You can get the words of God dwelling in you richly. If you're not singing at all, you're missing out on a big part of getting Christ to dwell in you richly. You say, oh, I'm reading my Bible for hours, and I'm going soul winning for hours. You're missing a part of the Bible if you're not singing, if you're not praising Him, if you're not lifting up your voice. You're not, getting, you're not getting filled with the Holy Ghost if you're not singing at all. If you're not singing and praising God, you're not getting the fullness of the Spirit. We get the, we get the Bible, we get the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly by singing. By the psalms, by the hymns, by spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's going to help you cast down all the wicked imaginations. So we'll go to my fourth point. We saw that through preaching, through reading, through singing. The last point I have, go to John chapter 14. Go back to the chapter we had we started with. I'll read for you a couple of verses. My fourth point 
is memorizing. Mark chapter 13, verse 11, the Bible says, But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 12, verse 12, the Bible says, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour, what you ought to say, a parallel passage. Now I think when I used to read this passage, I didn't really understand what it meant. But I think in order, I think for this verse to really come true, you have to have the words of God in your heart. You have to have memorized the word of God. Because how is the Holy Ghost going to speak through you if you've never heard the word of God? If you don't have anything memorized, if you've never read it, if you've never sung it. The Bible's just saying in that moment, the Holy Ghost is going to use all the arsenal you've been given. And when you memorize God's word, when you put to memory all the words of the Holy Ghost. He has a lot more to bring to your remembrance. That's a key word. Remember. Can you remember something that you never learned? No, he doesn't say, I'm going to teach you something you never learned. I'm going to show you something brand new. No, he's going to bring something into remembrance. Look at John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. He's saying, look, the power of the Holy Ghost is to help you remember God's Word. He's saying it may be hard to memorize God's Word. That's why you need the power of the Holy Ghost. You need to be filled with the Spirit so the Spirit can help you remember God's words. He can help bring a verse to your mind. Maybe you've been out soul winning. Or maybe you've been talking to somebody about the Word of God. And a verse just pops in your mind that you didn't even necessarily try really hard. That's the Holy Ghost helping bring in remembrance that Word of God. Bringing help in remembrance the things that you've memorized. Bringing in remembrance the things that you've sung. Bringing in remembrance the things that you heard somebody preach. I mean, there's verses that I haven't tried to memorize that I just heard a preacher say over and over, and I got it in my heart. Why? Because the Holy Ghost wants to bring in remembrance the words that are in this book. He wants to bring them in your remembrance. But if you never hear preaching, you're never reading your Bible, you're never singing any songs, the Holy Ghost doesn't have anything to bring in remembrance. Even if you're saved. I mean, what are you gonna what are you gonna remember? Maybe the one or two verses you heard to get saved, John 3 16. Everybody, every unsaved person can grow up that verse. Maybe you should grow up a little bit. Get a little strong meat. Grow in the Lord. I'll read for you another verse. It says in 1 John 2, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you. Ye shall abide in Him. So the Bible is saying, you don't need another guy to teach you the Bible. You just need the Holy Ghost. Now it's good to hear preaching. God's ordained preaching. We should hear men of God preach the Word. That's going to help fill us with the Spirit. It's going to help motivate us, help exhort us. But there's nothing that that guy can get up and preach to you that you couldn't just read from the Bible on your own. That the Holy Ghost couldn't show you from comparing spiritual to spiritual. So if somebody's teaching you a doctrine that you can't find in the Bible, it's not from the Holy Ghost. That's why I know that speaking in tongues is a fraud. Because right. every single person that does this ecclesiastical speech, does this glossolalia, does this speaking in tongues, they got it taught to them by a man. Right. They did not get it taught to them by the Holy Ghost from the words of the Bible. Why? There's no clear verse that shows you how to do this junk that says do all this babbling and do all this stupid speaking. No. They have to have a man come and show you how to do it. A man teach you how to do that. But we know that the words of the Holy Ghost, it'll teach you all the doctrines of the Bible. If you can't prove it in the clear statements of the Bible, it's not a doctrine the Holy Ghost teaches. Because He'll teach you all things from the Bible. You know, and I guess my thought for all mothers is the thought that my mom had. It's a good thought to have your kids to want to hear the word of the Holy Ghost, to hear God's voice. But you know what my mom should have been doing? She should have been preaching me the Bible. She should have been reading to me the Bible. She should have been singing to me the Bible. She should have been making me memorize the Bible. If she really wanted me to hear God's Word, if she really wanted me to hear the Holy Ghost, she would have been preaching me the Bible. Every day, every morning, all the time, she would have been teaching me the Bible. 
She would have been making me read the Bible. She said, you need to go and read your Bible. Read this many chapters. Read the Bible. Showing me how to read. Just teaching me how to read. She would have been singing me songs all day. Singing me the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs. Helping me learn the words of God. She would have been making me memorize God's Word. She would have, you know, our church always has a Bible memory passage. I think it's awesome that there's so many kids in our church that memorize the Bible. That have been memorizing. How, how would it be great if someday, you know, an 18-year-old guy decided he wanted to be a pastor or a 20-year-old man decided I want to be a pastor and he already had 100, you know, chapters of the Bible memorized or something. I mean, what a great tool, what a great arsenal to have that mothers should teach their children. And even if they don't want to be a pastor, even if they're not going to serve God, you know, as a full-time evangelist or something, it's going to help you in your daily life. It's going to help you as a soul winner. It's going to help you fulfill the calling of God in your life to have the words of God in your heart. That's how you can hear the word of God. And the Bible said this at the end of that verse. It says, ye shall abide in him. If you want to abide in Christ, which is so important, you've got to hear the words of the Holy Ghost. You got to get them in your mind through the preaching, through the reading, through the singing, through the memorization. It's not the imagination of your own heart. No, it's God's word. And there's a lot of different ways that we can get that in our heart. We need to employ all ways. The world's a full scale attack on your mind today. So you need to take a full scale attack from the Bible to fill yourself with the Holy Ghost. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, God, for giving us your word. Thank you for the words which the Holy Ghost spake by the mouths of the prophets. That we can hear the Holy Ghost every day. That we live in a country where we can go get a King James Bible anywhere. That we can hear good preaching. That we can come to a church. That we can hear good preaching. That we can read your word. That we can sing praises unto you from the Psalms, from the hymns, from the spiritual songs. And not only that, that we have a church that encourages us to memorize the Bible. So that we can get all of your words deep into our heart. So that we can abide in you. And then as we abide in you, we can bring forth much fruit. I pray that every single person in this room would see the importance of casting down imaginations and filling themselves with the words of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.